The CNS would now like to call to the stage Dr. Chris Shaffrey, who will be presenting his talk on adapting spinal deformity alignment principles to achieve improved outcomes for many degenerative spine conditions. Thank, Thank you, Chris. You. Thank you. Well, it's certainly humbling to follow these outstanding lectures. Uh, th these are my disclosures. So I'm going to talk about something that may be seen, at least initially thought to be a little bit more mundane. So why should we as neurosurgeons and anyone who does any spine surgery care about deformity principles? In large part because there is some component of deformity in, in some patients who have even simple or thought to have simple degenerative conditions. And a failure to address the deformity component can often give a poor outcome to a surgical procedure even if there's a successful decompression and or fusion. Now this is not a talk about encouraging major instrumentation and fusion for the vast majority of degenerative cases. And greater than 85% of degenerative spine conditions should be treated with a decompression alone or a decompression and limited fusion. And what I'm going to address is identifying the 15% of patients who are likely going to fail with that type of surgical approach. Now this is a, 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 a series of patients that were treated in the 1990s, and if you look at the series, approximately one in three patients who had had a disc herniation or a treatment for spinal stenosis or a treatment for degenerative spondylolisthesis failed and required a reoperation, and even a greater number failed and, and were not doing well. And the question is, how can we go and refine our techniques and technology to reduce this number of failures? Now this is not something that is new to me. And I trained under uh, John Jane, and one of the things he had asked me to do as a resident is said, look at, there's about a third of the patients, no matter what I do, they just do not seem to do well. So this was an analysis of looking at uh, uh, patients with lumbar spinal stenosis treated by a decompression alone. And what was it found is about one third of the patients ended up having a poor outcome. They needed uh, revisions in, in, in over 40% of the cases. So Dr. Jane, who was a very thoughtful man, said, we must be doing something wrong. This third of the patients are doing poorly. I, I, we're missing something. So this is a talk that he gave to the joint section in 2004. And the results of his talk, his analysis was, when people stood up, uh, who were relatively asymptomatic when they were sitting or lying and stood up and when they tried to walk or tried to do activity, who got searing back pain, pain in their buttocks and thighs. He felt it was a matter of continued neural compression and that by going and removing more and more bone and removing all the compressive elements that you would eventually turn out to have a good outcome in this third that failed. So he devised these procedures, one called the blast off, one called the posterior total resection, that he removed more and more and more bone. Unfortunately, despite this operation, when there were no posterior elements left to compress anything, the patients continued to have severe back pain, searing pain in their legs when they tried to get up and walk. And this is one of his, uh, this is his blast off procedure. And this is what one of these patients looked like uh, a year or so after being blasted off. So the fact is, is that there was clearly something going on besides neural decompression, uh, because when he was finished the decompression, there was nothing left whatsoever. So they said, well, there's got to be something else. And even in the modern area, this is a case that was, uh, that was referred in by a fairly competent neurosurgeon who had, had done four operations. And he said, I kept on decompressing the patient, decompressing the patient, and the patient could not stand and could not walk. And this is how the patient started out initially, and this is what the patient looked like when they were sent to me. And the fact is, this patient has a spinal deformity. It was a spinal deformity that was uh, created by some iatrogenic surgical intervention, but the fact is that this needed a realignment procedure to do it. So what's happening is you can either treat a deformity by improving it, or if we don't do things right, we can create a deformity and really go and harm our patients and create this one-third of patients who have a poor outcome. So is there a unified degenerative spine theory that's present that we can go and we can assess patients appropriately to go and dial in the ideal, uh, ideal operation and hopefully reduce our failure rate to under 5%? 
So the first thing to realize is that spinopelvic alignment does influence outcomes. And as patients lose their lumbar lordosis and become more malaligned, they become more symptomatic. And what's happening is, this is something that's been gradually realized. This was a study that was done in the early 2000s where they looked at people with some degenerative scoliosis. And what they thought was the magnitude of the scoliosis was going to be the, the principal symptom driver. But what they ended up finding out, that loss of lumbar lordosis was far and away the most important aspect of why people had symptoms. So this is a, a typical patient, one of mine, who you can see this profound loss of lumbar lordosis, actually a little bit of kyphosis in the area. And you can see the neural compression, which is a component that needs to be addressed. But you can see by realigning this patient that the patient's symptoms are markedly, markedly better. So why is this alignment important? It's because your body needs to expend much more energy if you're malaligned. If you lose this lumbar lordosis and you're pitched forward, all the muscles in your back, to your buttocks, your thigh, have to extend more energy for you to be able to stand in an upright posture. And this has been shown from study after study, the amount of disability that's present by losing this alignment and being pitched forward. Now, what's been realized more recently, however, is there's a substantial interplay between the pelvis and its alignment and its ability to be able to compensate at least for a mild loss of lumbar lordosis. So what we realize is that there are some people who are born with relatively limited lordosis, and this is related to the positioning of the spine and a, and, and a measurement and a parameter called pelvic incidence. And there's some people that have a big amount of lumbar lordosis, and, and which type of spine that you have and how that's fitted into the pelvis has a profound impact on the treatment that we'll eventually perform. And it's been shown that this pelvic incidence measure and your lumbar lordosis should be within 10 degrees of each other. And if this parameter is missing, and as you go and you drift further and further apart from this, the amount of symptoms become higher and higher. So what we see here is that we know that two-thirds of the lumbar lordosis should occur between L4 and S1. And if we do an operation where we lose lumbar lordosis, particularly at these two segments, which are the ones most commonly treated when we're doing a fusion procedure, that we go and set the person up for real disadvantages moving forward. So the, the lordosis in the bottom of the lumbar spine is critical. So this was what happens if you lose this lordosis. And again, study after study has shown that the people become progressively more symptomatic. Now what's happening is through something called the ISSG, which I'm a member, we've done a series of different studies now looking over 5,000 patients and correlating the outcomes of spinal alignment and how people do both before surgery and after surgery. And what we found was that the single biggest driver in all degenerative conditions is the relationship between the lumbar lordosis and the pelvic incidence. And this correlates very significantly with patient symptoms, and the breakoff point is somewhere around more than 10 degrees mismatch between the pelvic incidence and the lumbar lordosis. The second biggest parameter is how pitched forward we are. This is called the sagittal vertical axis. And as again, as this gets more and more out of, out of whack, people's symptoms increase. And then finally, the, the ability of your body to retrovert your pelvis to try to keep you upright is the third most important parameter, but it involves you expending a substantial amount of muscular energy. So what we found is, is that we knew what parameters cause symptoms. The next question was, if we can bring them back to normative values, can we get a good outcome with patients? And what we did was a series of studies looking at this, and what we found, and this is a patient here with a big mismatch, 48 degrees between lumbar lordosis and pelvic incidence, and what we found by realigning the spine, we had greater than 90% improvement in pain and function by achieving this. And this is a study by Justin Smith, my partner, looking at this and found that very repro reproducibly this was true. And again, one of my cases showing someone severely malaligned and the results in the improvement in their function after their surgery. Now, it's been proven, and if you ask any deformity surgeon, this is now considered, considered the, you know, a dictum. But what's happening is, is, is this true as we look at smaller cases, the cases that most people in the audience are doing on a day-to-day -day basis? 
So what's happening is this is a recent review where they looked at a variety of different studies looking at conditions, and this is for lumbar spinal stenosis and degenerative disc disease, and again shows these high correlation between these parameters and good outcome. Here's another looking at degenerative spondylolisthesis, and I'm going to dive a little bit more deeply in a few of these studies. So what's happening is, does everybody need large, long cassette x-rays on every single person that they're going to do an operation on for a degenerative condition? The answer is no. But I think most patients, particularly anybody you're considering to do a fusion on, should have a standing lumbar radiograph that includes the hips. And by going and doing this measurement of the lumbar lordosis and the pelvic incidence, you'll be able to identify all patients that are at risk and to modify your surgical procedures to try to improve the lumbar lordosis in those, procedures who, uh, those patients who need the procedures the most. So this is a study looking at lumbar laminectomy for spinal canal stenosis. And this study looked at all the people who did poorly. And what they found was the most significant predictor of residual symptoms after a laminectomy was the amount of preoperative lumbar lordosis. And those people with a flat uh, lumbar spine inevitably did poorly with the decompression alone. This is another study looking at patients with spinal stenosis. They found, again, spinal imbalance and high BMI were the two largest factors for poor outcomes. Another study, again, of spinal stenosis. They found that increasing SVA and loss of lumbar lordosis most closely correlated with increased pain and poor function after a decompression for spinal stenosis. And this goes and shows the measurements that were done in the study and the outcomes. And you can see that there was a substantial, uh, substantially poor result in those patients who were malaligned prior to surgical intervention. So this is, this is a patient, I think, is sort of a classic one where there's a risk for an unrecognized deformity. And if you look at the CT myelogram, you might not go and appreciate the really the treacherous amount of, uh, of deformity that is inherently present in this patient. So what you can see when you measure this, that this patient has a mismatch between their lumbar lordosis and their pelvic incidence of 23 degrees, showing this patient has a very substantial but somewhat hidden spinal deformity. And eventually we realize that when we go and have this mismatch greater than 10 degrees, that these patients are at very high risk from a poor outcome from either a decompression alone or a decompression in a limited fusion. In this particular patient, a more extensive revision was done with a really good result. Now here's a study looking at patients with ismic spondylolisthesis, and it showed that those patients who did the best had the best improvement of the pelvic tilt, re uh, restoring the uh, lordosis enough to influence that parameter. And again, showing here how they went and got an extra five to seven degrees of lordosis that really made the difference between a good outcome and a poor outcome. This is another, uh, another study looking at, again, ismic spondylolisthesis showing the same overall results. And again, the results and the importance of getting some improvement in lordosis, even with a one-level fusion. So what happens? The consequences of failure to achieve postoperative alignment results in poor clinical outcomes, and we're seeing that in paper after paper. It results in a much higher failure rate with adjacent segment breakdown when you go and fail to realign the spine and it has additional uh, problems due to junctional stresses. And perhaps the most single most important study of looking at the results of, again, single-level fusions. This was going and, and looking at patients who either had alignment objectives achieved and those who didn't, and it was found that if you did not get your spine appropriately realigned on even a one-level fusion, you had a 10-time higher risk of needing an eventual revision surgery. So alignment, even for simple degenerative conditions, is important. How you do that, there are lots of different ways, and that's beyond the scope of the talk. But just, just in general, this is a patient that I saw who came with an MRI scan alone. You see the standing lumbar x-ray, and we know this, that this person's lumbar lordosis pelvic incidence mismatch is 45 degrees. This patient has a deformity. This patient would have been the one in three who failed from a decompressive surgery 20 years ago. So what happens is, this is the preoperative planning. This is the result that was shown interoperatively. And this is why this is important. 
So first of all, in conclusion, degenerative conditions may have a component of spinal deformity. If you don't look, you won't recognize it. Understanding the parameters are important. Remember to measure alignment preoperatively. There's lots of techniques that can give you a good result. Thank you.